Hello. So in the first part of this presentation, I will review the literature related to gender and philosophy and practices with a special emphasis on focusing and its application to music and the arts. I will start by clarifying the philosophical background that underlines Jenland's explorations of experiencing defined as all that goes on, quote, all that goes on within the organism that is capable of being felt, unquote. Next, I describe Jenland's forays into psychotherapy research and the elaboration of his approach to focusing as a therapeutic practice. Thirdly, I will mention several applications of Jinlin's ideas to the fields of philosophy, psychotherapy, education, design, among others. Lastly, I will review literature that addresses the relationship between focusing and the expressive arts a particular focus on music. In the second part of this presentation, I will present a study conducted with eight creative musicians who are also experienced focusing practitioners on their experience of music creation. So Eugene Jenlin's Eugene Jenlin first proposed the concept of felt sense as early as the 1950s, when he was a young philosopher studying at the University of Chicago, where he was also being initiated into the person-centered therapy, into person-centered therapy, under the supervision of Carl Rogers. So Jenlin acknowledged that his philosophy is inspired by previous thinker, thinkers progressing from authors like Diltai, Husserl, Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, and Heidegger, among others, James Dewey. When reflecting on the history of Western philosophy, Chindlin asserts that experience has generally been, been conceived as a type of formal system by philosophically analyzing knowledge or science and arriving at what were considered valid basic assumptions, it was then concluded that experience would have to conform to such conceptual schemes. Experience was thought to possess in itself the forms necessary for knowledge to be possible. However, after philosophers like Dilta, Wittgenstein, Husserl, Heidegger, and Merleau-Ponty, this perspective became unfashionable. It is now generally held that philosophical frameworks should not be read into experience, even though they should be based on Thus, based on the realization that nature is neither conceptually ordered nor arbitrary, and that there have always been several definitions of truth and goodness, Chandler presents us with the conundrum. If experience is not structured as a conceptual, conceptual framework, how is it possible to develop verbal schemes about experience without undue imposition of the thematized description on the non-thematic experience, the uh, character on the non-thematic character of, of the given experience? If we intend to ground our assertions on experience that is as yet conceptually unstructured, how do we access this experience? And how do we know whether there is resonance between the forms and the experience? These questions are at the heart of Jenlin's philosophical project. 
which can be described as an attempt to understand how experiencing functions in our thinking, logical forms, distinctions, rules, algorithms, categories and patterns, and our actions. However, how can we avoid thinking about the datum of experience as being conceptual in nature or merely chaos? Generally, in postulates, two guiding principles. First, we would have to be able to dip into that datum in a way that is not fully determined by existing forms. And second, the datum of experience would have to provide some kind of differential feedback regarding different forms. So regarding the first condition, Chandler notes that firstly, it is possible to have a sense of our being in the world, a parallel idea to Heidegger's the Finley kite. The terms Jinlin created for a person's feel of their whole situation were direct reference, 1962, and felt sense. According to Jindlin, a false sense is, by its very nature, not fully graspable, although it is felt in the body. Even though words can point to it, it is necessary to contact our experiencing in order to access the felt sense. It is holistic and can generate an order of steps that goes beyond logical order, although it still functions when we think logically. Multiple, multiple terms have been created that share some similarities with general salt sense, although they do have differences, namely intuition, embodied awareness, bottom-up processing, limbic attunement, non-conscious right brain processing, and intuitive implicit. With regard to the second condition, can we really say that the datum of experience, which Jendlin also calls implicit, can provide differential feedback? Chenlin responds affirmatively to this question. Chenlin claims that when we have a sense of what we want to say, it's very improbable that a random sentence will accru ac accurately convey it. A very limited number of sentences, if any, will create a sense of resonance with the felt sense will carry it forward. Most sentences will not evoke any significant response. When we really explicate the implicit, there is a sense that what became explicit was already implicit before the distinction is made. In the book, A Process Model, Shinlan develops a philosophical system of living processes based on the explication of the implicit body environment process. This process is the basis for our felt body. As Jensen explains, your physical, quote, your physically felt body is in fact part of a gigantic system of fear and other places, now and other times, you and other people, in fact, the whole universe. This sense of being bodily alive in a vast system is the body and it, and it, as it is felt from inside." Unquote. This implicit body environment process can be accessed through the felt sense 
Chenlin elucidates this by describing how Isadora Duncan used to stand still at times for long periods, waiting for movements that come from the central spring from which all movement comes. For Chenlin, this inner movement by which we realize we are more than imposed conceptual structures, and that allows us to use different models in relationship to experience, which we concretely, to a felt sense that we concretely experience, is a source of palpable freedom. Moreover, Chenlin claims that at the current historical juncture, the capacity to bring together logical precision and our implicit experiential knowing might be fundamental to find solutions to the global problems we are facing. Now, I'll review the uh, Jenlin's work in psychotherapy quickly. Uh, as aforementioned, while a philosophy student at the University of Chicago in the 1950s, Jenlin started working with renowned psychotherapist Carl Rogers at the University of Chicago Counseling Center. One of the reasons that made Rogers' group particularly significant was their pioneering work of line-by-line -line analysis of transcriptions of therapy sessions. Based on the results of this analytical process, Jenlin and Zimring published an article, 1955, where they described several dimensions of experiencing and the types of process that lead to personality change in psychotherapy. This article was followed by a series of papers where Jenlin explored different aspects of experiencing and the therapeutic process, such as the therapeutic relationship, interpretations made by the therapist, and congruence. The influence of Jenlin's concepts of structured and process experiencing on Rogers' work was notably apparent in Rogers' article, A Process Conception of Psychotherapy. After significant research with neurotic individuals at the University of Chicago Counseling Center, Rogers, Jenlin, and other colleagues initiated an ambitious five-year research study on the application of client-centered therapy to a population of schizophrenics at a state psychiatric hospital in Wisconsin. The, the working hypothesis was that providing therapy aligned with Rogers' core conditions of unconditional positive regard, empathy, and congruence would promote uh, improvement in this population, which would correlate with higher scores in the Rogers process scale, even though the therapeutic outcome did not go as expected, the study was an important source of reflection, which resulted in further refinements of the client-centered approach to psychotherapy. Jenlin recognized that client-centered therapy was already undergoing changes before the Wisconsin study, identifying three main lines of change. First, uh, the therapeutic relationship and the focus on client-centered attitudes rather than client-centered behaviors. Second, the therapist's authenticity in self-expression. And third, the role of the implicit in therapeutic process. Nonetheless, the characteristic ways in which schizophrenic patients tend to respond to psychotherapy, namely lack of motivation, silence, 
lack of exploration and intense non-verbal interaction led, led to an intensification of these new psychotherapeutic trends. After the Wisconsin study came to an end, Jemlin returned to Chicago and together with Klein, Matthew and Kisla, developed what came to be known as the experiencing scale. The purpose of this instrument is to measure the depth of experiencing, which the authors defined as the process of looking inwards to find a felt sense of significance, which provides the content for self-expression. The scale consists of seven levels of experiencing from self-expression without reference to inner experience to in-depth connection with the felt sense, which provides access to new understandings and solutions to significant problems. To apply the scale, the researcher trained in how to recognize different levels of experience here reads the transcripts of therapy sessions according to the seven levels detailed in a training uh, Now I'll try to describe the genesis of focusing as a teachable skill. Research studies in the field of psychotherapy that applied the experiencing skill seem to suggest that the most successful clients tend to have higher levels of experiencing than the less successful ones. This motivated Jenlin to find ways to help clients who did not naturally, act, naturally access higher levels of experiencing, which led to the development of the six focusing steps. First published in 1978, Jenlin's book called Focusing outlines the six steps proposed by Jenlin uh, to facilitate the process of learning, folks. The steps are, first, uh, clearing the space, second, connecting with the felt sense, third, finding a handle, fourth, resonating handle with felt sense, fifth, asking, and sixth, receiving. While some authors perceive the, the focusing steps as too directive to be considered person-centered, both Jenlin's focusing and Rogerian person-centered therapy share the intention of not imposing interpretations on the felt experience of the client. The first step of focus, called clearing the space, as we've said, consists of going into the body and getting a sense of how life is given. What is alive inside? Frequently, there are several issues present. Um, and in this step, the objective is to become aware of the multiple things that may be alive in that moment and find some comfortable distance from them. The second step, connecting with a felt sense, is about choosing the particular aspect we want to focus on and getting in touch with the unclear bodily feel of the whole situation, the whole issue. Instead of paying attention to specific details, we sense the whole thing. Third step invites the focuser to let a word, phrase, or image which captures the global quality of the felt sense we connect with in the second step. Emerge. We allow the, focus, the word, phrase, or image to emerge from the implicit interest. The fourth step, uh, resonating involves holding both the handle and the felt sense and awareness and pay attention 
to bodily felt signals that may indicate the appropriateness of the habit. The fifth step, asking, describes the process of asking questions and allowing the response to emerge from the concept. Uh, the focus here is encouraged to stay with the thought sense until a symbol emerges that brings with it a subtle release or felt shift. The sixth step, receiving, suggests welcoming and staying with any shifts that occurred, whether subtle or salient. Later research by Aoki and Ikemi helped clarify the attitudes that are more conducive to the process of focus, which are usually grouped under the more general term focusing attitude. These attitudes are, first, being aware of the felt sense, second, accepting and acting from the felt sense, and third, finding a comfortable distance from the felt sense. Um, and to measure the degree to which these attitudes are being embodied, the focusing manner scale was created by these two authors, Aoki and Nikami. Um, Chinlin's philosophy and practice of focusing have been applied to a variety of fields, which include philosophy, mathematics, qualitative research methodology, design, complexity theory, spirituality, eco-psychology, and even the Alexander Technique. Another application has been in the area of psychotherapy. In 1996, Jenlin published a book where he describes his own approach to psychotherapy called Focusing Oriented Psychotherapy, uh, more recently called just Focusing Oriented Therapy, FOT. And this approach draws considerably on the traditions of phenomenology and Rogers' person centered therapy even though it incorporates a diverse array of techniques from other therapeutic traditions. Because it is based on a wider philosophy, Jenlin's philosophy of the implicit, and the particular theory of personality change, Jenlin's framework allows the therapist to navigate different techniques in a coherent manner. Other authors uh, have further explored different aspects of focusing-oriented therapy, such as the importance of therapeutic relationship, existentialist psychotherapy, spirituality, trauma, and neuroscience. Later in his career, Jenlin and Mary Hendricks also developed an approach to theory development um, based on focusing called Thinking at the Edge. This approach consists of 14 steps organized into three parts. First, speaking from the felt sense. Second, finding patterns from this first part of speaking from the felt sense. Then with these patterns, step three, in step three, we build theory. The purpose behind thinking at the edge or TAE is to facilitate the development of theory that is closely guided by the thought sense. And when discussing creativity, Jindlin addressed what he calls negative and positive ways of defining the concept. The negative way focuses on the letting go of the usual ways of seeing, thinking, and acting, and the tolerance for ambiguity. However, according to Jindlin, the question of what may be happening in creativity, uh, besides not focusing on explicit formulation, seems more difficult to answer. Uh, he provides some evidence for considering 
that paying attention to the felt sense may, is an aspect of creativity in general. Focusing allows for the emergence of new steps, the feeling, thought, and action. Following the felt sense's intrinsic directionality, which would not be possible if we only proceeded from what was already clear. Jenlin draws a parallel. He draws a parallel between creativity and therapy by pointing out that both processes involve a redirection of attention from clearly articulated and explicit formulations to an unclear felt sense of the situation. The creative person is able to stay with this vague sense in order to then articulate something new. The new expression can then be checked against the felt sense. When the expression is adequate, a sense of rightness and resonance emerges. This ability of the felt sense to provide feedback regarding the right next step seems relevant to the process of autistic creation. Krugman presents two reasons for why focusing is an inherently creative activity. One, the six steps of focusing, according to, to Krugman, delineated by Jenlin, the, the six steps, map onto Wallace's four steps of, creative, of creativity, preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. And second, the insights resulting from the focusing process tend to be original, useful, and surprising. The three criteria proposed by Simonton, Simonton for assessing creative outputs. Also, there have been numerous attempts to apply focusing to art and expressive arts therapy, arts-based research, creative writing, and the visual arts. Uh, Laurie Rappaport developed a therapeutic modality called focusing-oriented art therapy, which integrates focusing and the visual arts into psychotherapy. In this process, the felt sense is carried forward through drawings, paintings, collages, or other visual expressions. Rappaport asserts that the felt sense opens the door to the body's wisdom and creativity, and that the arts can provide a pri privileged medium to express inarticulate body, bodily impressions. Rappaport also presented a model for bridging focusing with expressive arts therapy, which includes dance in movement, writing, music, and drama, while paying passionate attention to the felt sense. A resonant word or phrase may be turned into a poem or writing, an image into visual art, a gesture into movement or a dance, and a sound into music or sound exploration. The close relationship between focusing and autistic expression is illustrated by Gvenkovic, a Croatian focusing practitioner and folk dance. The author describes how focusing was essential to faithfully express her experiences of dancing through writing, allowing her to cross the apparent divide between bodily knowing and the written word. Similarly, the artist and psychotherapist Mikhail Goldfarb in 92, investigated the role of the felt sense in art making by analyzing her own work and the work of other painters. She details how paying attention to the felt sense of the artwork can be essential for the creative process. However, Crickman notes that 
the relationship between focusing and autistic processes outside of therapy could benefit from more empirical studies. Now, I'd like to discuss the topic of focusing and music. Suzanne Langer argued that music is, in general, only capable of expressing the changing aspects of human emotion through its dynamic patterns of tension and resolution. Carlin Robinson's research into the expression of cognitively complex emotions in Shostakovich's 10th Symphony puts into question longer stance. The authors depict one of the feelings they can identify when listening to the piece as a hopeful, quote, hopeful glance at the future from a time that is shrouded in unease, an easy contemplation of the past, end quote, illustrating how music can elicit complex and nuanced feelings. In another study, uh, Zantna and his colleagues collected reports of participants' emotional responses to music and performed a factor analysis in order to construct a taxonomy for the classification of emotions commonly induced by music. Instead of finding, excuse me, instead of finding factors related to utilitarian emotions like joy, anger, fear, disgust, and contempt, Zentner and his team found nine dimensions which the authors classified as aesthetic, namely wonder, transcendence, nostalgia, tenderness, peacefulness, joyful activation, tension, sadness, and power. Ansdell agrees that music has the potential to express complex fields. He states that, quote, perhaps the key teaching of musical epiphany is just this, glimpses of, glimpses of beauty, wholeness, health, and truth are often manifested within frailty, damage, illness, and wholeness. And sorry, frailty, damage, illness, and fragmentation. This idea reflects Rima's observation that, quote, a deep, profoundly moving experience of music can somehow yield an altered perception of the world in which the paradox of simultaneous good and evil is not seen as something to be overcome, but as something to be accepted, unquote. Small claims that music is able to express feelings that words seem unable to effectively communicate. Music's capacity to elicit nuanced and even contradictory feelings seems to allow this autistic genre to convey the full richness of experiencing, which, according to Jenlin, is much more intricate than our concepts and phrases can capture. Jenlin compares a felt sense to a symphony, as the felt sense is composed of many details. So the symphony is composed of many musical notes played by numerous instruments. However, both can be felt as a whole, regardless of how many details are contained in them. Jindlin draws another connection between music and a felt sense when he compares the latter to, quote, a great musical chord that makes you feel a powerful impact, a big, round, and clear feeling, end quote. Furthermore, Shenlin argues that music has the power to carry forward the whole body environment process and have a deep impact on the felt experience. 
Various authors have applied Jenlin's ideas to the field of music. And in an attempt to bridge focusing and music listening, White conducted a phenomenological study with seven participants on their experience with the process, um, with the process developed by White called music focus. Participants chose and listened to, listen to music uh, they felt was related to how they were feeling in the moment and then focused on the felt sense elicited by the music. The sessions were recorded, transcribed, and analyzed using interpretative phenomenological analysis, or IPA. As an additional interpretive tool, why to use the experiencing scale to get more insight into participants' depth of experiencing. White concluded that while music focusing can be a quite powerful experience, it is possibly more appropriate for experienced focuses than for beginners. Also, agreeing with Lango, the author claims that music by itself does not seem to carry the body forward in a way that creates lasting resolution, even though it can effectively elicit the felt sense of stopped processes. Bridging Jenlin's philosophy and musical experience, Friedman uh, carried out a hermeneutic study on the phenomenology, phenomenology of musical flow. The author begins by critically reviewing two theories of embodied cognition by Lakoff and Johnson called uh, conceptual metaphor theory and image schema theory, asserting that their attempts to describe embodied thinking and transcend mind-body dualism are characterized by substantial philosophical and methodological inconsistencies. Friedman then describes a new approach to music theory based on the phenomenology of Michael Ponty, J.J. Gibson's psychology of affordances, and Jenlin's philosophy of the implicit. Friedman's model is aligned with Hasty's framework that describes how concepts from music theory can function creatively. Inspired by Jenlin, uh, Hasty criticizes the reification of theoretical concepts and encourages a focus on process, allowing concepts to lead beyond themselves. And with this, I end the first part of the presentation. Now, I'm going to present a qualitative study that explores the experiences of focusing and musical creation. The methodology used was Interpretative Phenomenological Analysis, or IPA. Participants were eight creative musicians, four female and four male, who were also experienced focusing practitioners. Eight online semi-structured interviews were conducted, transcribed and analyzed according to IPA's approach to data analysis. Interpretative phenomenological analysis is an ideographic phenomenological approach to qualitative research. It is usually used to study meaningful experiences like major life events. It has its theoretical roots in phenomenology and hermeneutics. And what distinguishes IPA from other qualitative methodologies is its focus it's phenomenological, interpretative, and ideographic focus. And now I'll present the results of that study. The first theme identified in the transcripts, I called it searching for presence. And it is about the importance expressed by the participants of having an inner attitude of openness, acceptance, recept 
receptivity, receptivity and relaxation, um, which is frequently called the, the focusing attitude, this group of characteristics among focusing practitioners. And the participants express the importance of this in both focusing and music creation. And we will also explore, explore specific processes like inner criticism that pose considerably cha considerable challenges uh, to sustaining the focusing attitude. First sub theme, focusing attitude explores different aspects of this inner state of presence. One of the participants, Tyler, emphasizes how important it is for him to have an attitude of openness during both focusing and music creation. He says, I have a posted note on my keyboard that came out of a focusing session. And it has to do with the creative process. And what it says in Hebrew, in Hebrew, it says, be the sky that flies and plays with the wind and the flow. And don't stay in the stuck and closed place. Breathe, and ventilate the creative process. And this, I have it on my keyboard because what happens is if I want something to happen, or if everything I do feels solid in the creative process, then it's very, very stuck. And uh, Laura, for example, emphasizes how this list, the listening, the listening posture seems similar in musical improvisation and focus, claiming that there are actually many processes that musicians do when creating music, they are similar to, to focus. She says, if you're improvising with someone, you're always listening, making space for them, supporting, maybe coming in and saying something and then stepping back while they say something. There's a lot that is very focusing like that musicians naturally do. Jason adds that it's important to be able to find some space inside when playing, which he compares to the first focusing step as taught by Jenny, called clearing a space, as we've seen, which involves setting aside any troubling feelings to find an inner space of presence. He says, you really have to have a focusing listener, listening attitude when you're playing. If someone's really in a really, in a really bad mood or stressed and he can't put aside, put that aside while he's playing, he will pretend to screw up part of what's happened, or he won't be able to enjoy it. He won't be able to receive it. You need to make sure that you're doing as much as you can. Do not let yourself get in the way. For it to really work, you have to put a lot of the other things that might be there on the side. Oh, and lots of bands do that. Uh, I used to do that with my band. 30 minutes before of concerts, uh, we would sit, we were kind of sitting, hanging out in the back. And even if no one was talking about it, we knew that that hanging out in the back, only the band members, was us getting ready for the show. I guess you could call it the musician version of clearing the space before you go to play. Hazel describes the process of relaxation when she improvises, which also tends to be associated with the focusing attitude. She says, so for me, improvising 
requires a kind of a giving over of tension. Okay, so, and the next sub-theme of the first theme, and let's, um, I'm going to say the name again, the first theme, searching for presence. The second sub-theme is challenges to presence. And in this sub-theme, participants explore in their obstacles they faced in their music creation journey. For example, Logan reports how fundamental it was for him to transition from a more extrinsic to a more intrinsic source of motivation when creating music. He equates what he calls body buzz to Jinlin's sense of a felt shift. The moment when something carries forward our felt sense in a life enriching way. Also, he considers that school promoted his desire for extra more approval. He says the following, I got this idea I had to impress everybody. And that just fucked me up. Because you can't impress everyone. Like, it's an impossible creative goal. And so, breaking that creative block was definitely very pivotal to me. Becoming a creator where I was creating for some other reason than external validation. And that's why learning about my own body buzz or my own interest for the sake of love of music or for the sake of curiosity or for some other reason than applause or acceptance. I had to discover that as a young adult, and that's part of my passion around pedagogy because I had excelled at school and so always got all the top marks, but in the process had done it all for external validation. And it was a very rude shock to realize I had no other reason to do anything. And that completely imploded. Logan explains how a focusing-like process helped him to overcome a two-year-long creative block motivated by a paralyzing desire for praise and acceptance by allowing him to choose one idea to work on. Something he wasn't, he couldn't do. He wasn't able to do this through more rational processes. He compares this process to focus. He says, I would lie on my back in my bedroom on the carpet for like half an hour so I just laid down, slowed my breathing, my breathing down and kind of meditated and just tried to relax. And then almost let my body sink into the floor, looking at my whole body and back, lying on them. And then just sort of to sort of say to myself, which one? Or what's the one to do? And then once my body in a relaxed way could say, oh, I want to do this one. And in a way that wasn't stressed. And then I just had to stay with that. But still lie down. And then if another idea came and said, oh, maybe you should do this though. And I've, I learned to just let go and say, yeah, that can be for the next piece. And so I just do this process. And when I sort of came to the choice when my mind could relax and let my body choose the one choice over the other, then I'd get up and do that. And so the reason why focusing feels so familiar is that I was doing these processes. Hmm. In this excerpt, excerpt, in the next excerpt that I'm going to read, Tyler brings our attention to how difficult it can be for musicians who frequently have music as a central aspect of their identity to question their vocation. Tyler says, I think this is part of the drama of musicians, where you establish a sense of identity, sometimes at such an early age, 
that you literally can't imagine yourself being anything else. When I was 16, I literally felt that being a musician and being a saxophonist was who I was. But that comes with a price because my sense of worth was interlinked with music. Everything depended on it, and I couldn't see beyond it. And okay, let's let's describe. I'm going to describe now the second theme. Second theme, I called it exploring false sensing. And in this theme, we'll explore false sensing in music and focusing, and also different ways of guiding people in focusing based music creation. So with this next excerpt, Tyler's, Tyler underlines the importance of self-connection, and authenticity in playing an improvisation, which is particularly pungent when we remember Tyler's struggles with belonging and wanting to fit in. When we, and she says, when we are in touch with our inner experience and we let it out, it's true. There wasn't any thought or planning or agenda about it. It was just like, this is true, no. And now I'm saying it and so I can't regret it because it's like regretting the reality of what now happens to be true. And I actually teach that sometimes as playing with no regret. Logan also mentions the bodily feedback system. He calls body buds as an important aspect of music creation. He says, my process involves coming up with the simplest thing possible that excites me which is this body buzz thing. And by saying body buzz, it doesn't have to be something like, whoa, amazing. It could just be like a very subtle, intriguing thing, but just the simplest thing I can do. And then just adding to it in as few ways as I need to. And this happens both when I'm playing live, but also when I'm pre-composing element. For Laura, music creation seems to be something that emotionally takes her over, whereas focusing seems to demand a higher degree of intentionality. I think it's more that I get that she says, I think it's more that I get seduced by writing music or seduced into it. It's more that kind of a thing than a conscious focusing process. It's more of, I fall in love with the world of that. So it's more of that kind of playful place than consciously trying to do focusing when I'm writing. Similarly, Hazel starts by saying that for her, a sense of Inward urgency is only present uh, in focusing, not in music creation. Uh, she says, when I'm improvising, there's not that inward urgency. There's not that working on all levels. There's also not that, aha, it's fun. And sometimes it's really meaningful. Tyler recounts an instance in which he clearly observed the musician intuitively, intuitively creating music through what for him was clearly a focusing process. He says, focusing is a natural thing, right? It's not like an invention or something that has to be imported into the person. I once sat next to a really good friend of mine while he was working out some lines in an arrangement. And he's never done focusing. He's sitting there, he's connecting inward, he's feeling, and out comes a line. Where does the music come from? 
Where does that line come from? It comes from a non-musical experience, an emotional energy, something inward. Then it finds its way out through the sound, it finds its way out, its way through the line, and the line is true to him, and it feels, yes, that's it. Because it came from a genuine sense. It was so moving to see it happening right in front of my eyes with somebody else. Jason didn't question whether improvisation, which is usually performed without long pauses and sometimes at a quite fast pace, can include focusing-like processes, which tend to be carried out at a significantly slow pace. He says, jazz is very felt and if you're very connected with the people that you're playing with, but at the same time, it seems to be too fast to be considered the actual pause and going in. So I also kind of have that question. What is happening in musical improvisation? What can the focusing process teach us of that? Or is it a completely separate phenomenon, despite how, it, how felt it feels, if that makes sense? Uh, talking about improvisation, he seems to think that focusing like processes are still possible at a faster pace. As, as exemplified in improvisation, he says, the argument against it, I think, is that it happens so fast. Like felt sensing is usually seen as something really slowish. I don't think that's the case. Um, Vanessa seems to enjoy accessing an inexhaustible source of creativity through focus. An edge from where new words can come and that she likens to improvisation. She says, that's why I like focusing so much as well. Because I can improvise, I can create, I can sort of go with the flow to know that there's this vast moreness that I can tap into. Diana notices that even though she has been a professional musician and focusing trainer for many years, she hasn't intentionally tried to combine the two. She says, it's clear that I haven't intentionally gone into a focusing mode in order to write music. I haven't intentionally combined the two. And now the second self theme, the second theme, which is exploring called center. And this next sub theme is guiding people in focusing based music creation. And regarding this theme, sub theme, Logan said, uh, describes a way of teaching music that is guided by one's bodily felt sense of rightness and not generic rules that are taught regardless of the needs of the learner. He says, in music, you can teach through steps and formula. But I think the damage it does and the amount of unlearning it requires later isn't worth it. And in fact, one could learn organically from what's alive in one's own way, so that one never has to like unlearn these kind of generic formulas. I think if one's learning from the inside out, from one's own genuine interest, and then you get interested in formulas, well, yeah, sure, go find out about them. That's such a different way of learning to being told to start with the formulas, regardless of your inner burning interest. There's so many steps and formulas one might be interested in that are never the same and that could always be different based on, our, on one's inner curiosities. Another participant, Brian, when talking 
about the similarities between the focus and the creative process, mentions the aspect of allowing his body to play without trying to consciously direct it. He says, the most obvious for me would be when I kind of reach because I go within first and allow. I close my eyes. I just let my body do it, literally. Diana suggests a genre, key, and style as creative constraints for focusing based music creation. So she says, what genre is it going to be in? Then it's like, this genre would probably really work well for it. Or then you might narrow it down to a key, then you might narrow it down to a style. But I think if I were to explore it, it is sort of in that sequence. And now, third theme, third theme for the musician's journey. And we'll explore participants' experience of learning music, the ways in which they create music, and the therapeutic effects of music. And regarding music learning, Jason, a mostly self-taught musician exemplifies the impact of the internet on music learning and having lessons at 23 mostly helped him to name and systematize what he, what he had already learned from YouTube, mostly from YouTube. He says, a lot of my music is intrinsically tied to YouTube. I didn't take jazz guitar lessons until like 23. And by that point, I already knew how to play a lot of it. And what the teacher did is he taught me a couple of things that I haven't thought of, thought of. but a, a lot of what he did is that he would name, oh, over this five chord, you can play a flat six melodic minor to resolve to the one. And that's something that I kind of knew, but I didn't know that that was how it was called. And in the next excerpt, we see how the negative experiences of Laura's siblings while attending piano lessons created a resistance in her to start formally learning piano, even though she already played a child. She says, I was nine. She started me a bit late. I didn't want to learn because my sisters and brother had hated it. Because they had like a really cranky piano teacher, but always played. But she didn't want to destroy my plan, talk, talking about her mom. So she sought out, my, to my great advantage, a really lovely, quite creative teacher. Vanessa, on the other hand, experienced her lessons as very frustrating, leading her to quit piano lessons as her impulse to learn by listening wasn't welcomed and nurtured. She said, I started playing the piano when I was seven. My piano teacher would play first, and when she discovered that I was playing what I had heard rather than what was on the sheet, she had music. She stopped playing first because she wanted to force me to learn the notes. And then at some point, I couldn't do it anymore, so I stopped. I didn't want to do the lessons anymore. I, I stopped playing the piano, and I'm pretty sure I could have been a decent piano player if someone had sort of turned that thing around. But I'm pretty sure that I made things up on the piano. I'm pretty sure I did that when I was a child. And second sub-theme of this third theme, which is the musician's journey, 
is ways of creating music. And regarding this topic, Laura distinguishes between composition and improvisation, as composition seems to encompass a more elaborate conceptual framework, which requires more reflection and premeditation. She says, composing feels like a larger commitment. It's more considered. It could be just as florid in improvising its ex execution, but it has a larger framework around it. Jason considers live improvisation as the most generative improvisational environment. He says, I find that in stage improvisation or live improvisation, you come up with more ideas than you would in our practice most of the time. If you really tune in, if you really forget about stuff, I make more mistakes when I'm improvising live and I think lots of those are really happy mistakes because there are things that I don't get frustrated at and go back and try to nail that idea again. I just kind of have to go with it. I think it's a really interesting space. Logan depicts the process of writing music as both a separation between felt meaning and the symbols it gives rise to, and also a new creative opportunity that allows for more complexity in the creative process. He says, you know, like the kitchen or in a restaurant behind the scenes, and then we take the food uh, out and over here we eat it. So it's like, here we put, we put it together and we have these felt senses and we create and things express. And then it comes out and we shunt it over here, plunk it down, and that's the external expre express published score or the musical performance or the dish at the restaurant. And we completely forget the context of its production and emergence. And it just consume it. Now, of course, one can do that. And the written printed book was the great technology that allowed us to do that even more. Because in talking, we are with the production of our own meanings. As soon as, as you write something down, can send it halfway across the world and you can separate it. We know that the written word is the sort of classic moment in human history when meaning both becomes more overt because things can be written down and you can play with them. When music starts to get notated, things get a lot more complex more quickly. And that's really interesting because you've got many more materials to work with. Brian compares fixing one of his approaches to music creation, which he calls channeling, which he considers to be a deeply spiritual process. He says, and then there's the channeling thing. My earlier material has more of a spiritual overture. Sarah keeps saying, you're 50 years ahead of your time. And maybe I was, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But I would consciously sometimes create order around me, like I was pregnant. You know, a woman before she's gonna give birth, she starts cleaning up the rooms and you know, all that kind of stuff. And I would do the same thing. I would straighten out my piano, clean the room, clean the room off, and then I'd sit down, I'd close my eyes, and you know, stuff would start happening. I wrote dozens of songs that way too. Just kind of sit there meditating or just reaching, reaching up. I have this idea that there are probably some beings on the less physical side who kind of work with me for some of that material. For Jason, Musical ideas seem to first appear unexpectedly and in a non-premeditated premeditated way, although this can happen 
in more or less emotionally charged situations and come with varying degrees of urgency in their expression. He says, I think songwriting has, at least for me, two ways that it comes about. And they're both kind of fun. They're both spontaneous. But one is very much because I'm feeling something intense. And it happens to manifest in music somehow. I could just be going through a really tough period of my life and I'll get the initial feeling of a little verse or I'll sing something and I like it. And I don't think I've ever sat down to write something. It's more like something pops up. I'm feeling really good or I'm feeling really bad. Something pops up. That's step number one. There's an emotional context and all of a sudden something appears and I have to go sit down and work on it right then. And the other one is more like, I'll just be driving and something will pop up and it will start there. And I'll take a couple of voice notes on my phone and I'll kind of puncture it, like changes to reggae here and I'll have a bass idea and I'll hum what I think for the drums and then I'll get home. And if I remember, I'll work on it. And the third sub-theme of the, the musician's journey theme is music as therapeutic. And Jason, Jason recounts a challenging situation of sexual abuse from his father and how music allowed him to better deal with all the resultant complex feelings. He says, my dad was a musician and I was sexually abused by my father between like ages five and eight. And my mom found out and we left my father and I never met him again. And I had strange kind of feelings of guilt because at age 12, I know I'm breezing over this, but at age 12, I gave my testimony in court and sent my dad to jail. And I didn't remember my sexual abuse. So I always had these weird feelings of guilt. What if it didn't happen? And I think part of my becoming a musician has helped me have a part of my father's memory that isn't weird, or that I feel guilty about, or it's like the part of my father's memory that I like to carry with me, if that makes sense. Because the good memories that I have with him were of him playing music for me before I went to bed and him showing me Stevie Ray Vaughan and the Beatles. Or if I couldn't sleep as a kid, he would put me on his shoulders and we would walk around town and I would be listening to music from a Walkman. I think my dad was a guitarist and a singer too. So my dad introducing me to music and just me kind of getting music on some level helps me have something of my dad. I have a guitar that's back here, is my dad's old guitar. And I don't know, it was, it was a parallel process to other things that I did in relation, to, in relation to my dad and forgiveness. But I liked that there's something I can be appreciative of my dad for. Even if that sounds weird, even if I was sexually abused by him, I never spoke with him. I don't, I didn't cry when he died. I like having something I appreciate of my memory of my father. The last theme is interaction as fundamental. And this final theme, interaction as fundamental, will explore different ways in which participants find interaction important in music creation and also their need for a sense of belonging. The first um, sub-theme is interaction in music. And for Jason, improvisation only feels real when done live with other musicians. He says, the only real improvisation is when you're playing live with people. There's improvisation 
when you're practicing and you're doing new concepts and it's a lot of fun and it's really cool. But I feel like there's something of the pressure when you're playing with other people and you're playing live and you have to be listening to them. It's not a backing track and you can pause and go back and you can't really be working on a specific idea. That's when real improvisation happens. When Essie explains how imbuing the song she's singing with meaning and deeply connecting with herself and the audience is a form of musical creation. She says, I think one of the strengths that I do have is to, I don't know what that word is in English, I've never found a good word for that, but to deliver the song, till the song, fill the song with meaning for the people who listen to it and have them feel touched in some way. That is the thing that I can do. Um, and which is also some kind of creation for me, I would say. And this kind of tapping into the depth of my soul. I don't know what to call it, the depth of my experience, the depth of my connection with the world and what people experience as well. Laura seems to find considerable value in having a private space uh, for her artistic work, where she can more easily develop her creative ideas. And here we can see interaction with the environment in music. She says, I actually moved out for a little while to find my own space. I moved out for 16 months from our family home. Excuse me. And I was back every day, but I just had a separate place to have my creative base. And that made it possible to think, to do things that were not possible with them, or to sustain something. I think it's possible to have the ground for something, but then to sustain and grow something that is another step. And that for me requires a space separate from the everyday of the domestic. And as an artist, unless you work in an institution, in which case it's pretty hard to be an artist anyway, because usually you're being paid to be an academic or a teacher, you really need a space separate from the domestic family domain. And finally, Laura adds that music creation is not only inseparable, from place, but also from the rest of her life. She says, I don't really see making and creating music as this majorly separate thing from living. It's just something, you know, one of the activities of life. And now the second sub theme of the fourth theme, which is interaction. The second sub theme is the sense of belonging. And about this, Tyler describes when he first experienced a sense of belonging outside of his family home. He says, in Israel, you go to the army. So I served as a musician, which was very fortunate because I could keep my music studies and playing, met other people, which opened my eyes. The first place I felt a tell, literal, I mean, not my parental home, I felt very much at home. But in terms of society, the first place I felt at home was when I was among other musicians in the army building, which was where all the musicians assembled. So there were classical musicians, there were pop singers, like these bands, just serving in the army. And I was a jazz musician, and I I felt finally I had arrived here because everybody seemed to be these kind of off-center musicians, kind of nerdy and maybe obsessed and sensitive. You knew that everybody had this core of sensitivity and love for music. 
That was when I was 18. I hadn't had anything like that in high school. After the army, the usual path for Israeli musicians was, okay, you got to get to find a way to go study in the United States. So I was like a horse with blinders on. I was like, that's where you have to go. It would be a huge embarrassment and shameful not to do it. I wasn't telling myself all these words, but that was the experience. It was like, you have to go there because if you get off this track, if you get off this track, it will be humiliation. And to conclude, I'd like to start by reflecting on the several themes that emerge during the analysis. And the first theme, searching for presence, participants seem to emphasize how having an attitude of openness, receptivity, and presence, which bears substantial similarities with the focusing attitude, helps with music, music creativity. Participants are also quite vocal regarding the considerable inner challenges they've had to deal with as music creators, including a strong need for external validation, self-criticism, and a strong attachment to their identity as musicians. In the second theme, exploring fault sensing, participants describe several similarities and differences between music and focusing in the dimensions of intentionality, inward uh, urgency to achieve resolution and pace, among others. They also described several ways of guiding people in focusing based music creation. And the third theme, the musician's journey. Participants talked about their, their music learning journey, different ways in which they create music, and also the therapeutic effect of music creation. Finally, in interaction as fundamental, the fourth theme, participants mentioned the importance of interaction in music and their need for belonging. And with this, I end this, this presentation and thank you very much for watching. I hope it was helpful. Thank you.